Addie Soldiers. I'm giving you claw clip and sweatshirt in an attempt to blend in with my audience today, but I do feel very much so. How do you do, fellow kids? To lend an air of authenticity to today's video, I've had three coffees, little sleep, and I'm actually using the mug that I used to bring hot drinks to class in. Hmm, tastes like English class and overdue assignments. It's the middle of September, which means that if you are in high school or university, that means that classes have been in session for a couple of weeks now, and I'm assuming at this point you're slowly feeling the weight of those decisions and regretting every choice that you've made in your life. And if you're watching this channel, you're probably some kind of English major or English major adjacent, which means that I know that you have a metric fuck ton of required reading to get through this year that you absolutely do not want to read. But as somebody with an English degree who has read a whole lot of those required reading books, I'm here today to tell you that there is in fact hope. There is a light at the end of the tunnel. Some of these required reading books actually kind of slap. It's a surprise to you as much as it was a surprise to me. I have found some of of my favorite books through required reading, through university classes, and through high school even. So you can show this video to prospective students, you can show it to your younger sibling who's just going into university, Hell, you can show it to yourself. Required reading has a reputation of being dull and annoying and written by a bunch of old racist white men, and yes, that is true. But like nowadays in high school, you guys are reading way cooler things. You guys are reading like The Hunger Games and The Hobbit and like Neil Gaiman and like supporting anti-book bans. I'm like, hell yeah, that is so cool. Why were my high school years so boring? That being said, I did read a couple of books that physically changed my brain chemistry. So here's a reminder that not all required reading is bullshit. So without further ado, grab a drink, grab a snack, and buckle in as we talk about the f f oh, f five? Six? How many books did I pick? Two, three, four. Okay, this is the part of class that if this were a real presentation, there would be like a bunch of awkward coughing and weird silence while the professor figured out what was going on with the projector slides. Here are six books that I read for university that I ended up really, really enjoying, and there might be a couple of honorable mentions at the end just for extra credit. Everybody settle down, class is in session. Number one is a classic, and it's a classic for a reason, and that is Jane Eyre by Charlotte Bronte. I know you don't want to hear it, but this book is good. <laughs> if you haven't read about it, heard about it, or watched the movie, this is how Jane Eyre goes. Jane is orphaned as a child, then she goes to live at a boarding school, and then eventually she becomes a governess, which is kind of like a live-in tutor for the mysterious Mr. Rochester and his ward, who's some girl. And then uh, when she's there, ooh, mystery, mayhem, there's some fire and uh, other shenanigans. And then he's like, not really hot, but like they kind of have a thing. This was originally published in 1847. And the style of writing and the style of novels has changed so much. Over the last almost 200 years, I understand why people don't like classics. I know a lot of people, and myself included, go into these classic books like Jane Eyre or Pride and Prejudice or Northanger Abbey thinking that they're dusty and boring and the writing is weird and annoying, but it's like you have to understand the social politics at the time. And like once you have that context, these books are freaking wild. And I wish that they taught more of the history before you read the novel, because if you knew like the stereotypes around what being a young governess meant going to a secluded mansion, like you would have so much more context over like why Jane is the way she is and like why people talk about her. But also considering the context of her time, Jane is a straight up badass. Her internal monologue is sassy as hell. She does not put up with any of Mr. Rochester's bullshit and I love her. And even when we get to, you know, the big fire and the reason behind it, she's like, um, hey, so like, what the fuck? And then when Mr. Rochester can't give her a good enough reason, she's like, mm, okay, uh, great. Would have liked to know this beforehand. Uh, I don't feel safe here, so I'm gonna leave. And then she just pieces out. If you wanna know about the history of this and society of the 1800s, as well as other classics like Pride and Prejudice, Northanger Abbey, Sense and Sensibility, etc. I would highly recommend going to Ellie Dashwood's channel because she breaks down all types of style and political norms of that period and it's really, really great. The second book was actually one that I read in my last year of university for a children's lit class where I did my big final year end project on diversity in YA books over the last 10 years. And one of the books that we had to read for that class that inspired that was Long Way Down by Jason Reynolds. This is a very unique YA book that is written completely in prose, which follows the story of Will, who is a a 15 year old black boy just finds out that his brother Sean has been shot and killed. In this awkward adolescent phase, Will still knows the rules and he knows that there is only revenge to be had. So he steals a gun from a drawer, he puts it in his back pocket and he walks to the elevator to go down to the street and seek revenge on Sean's killer. However, when he gets into the elevator, he is stopped at every floor and someone from his past alive or dead gets on. So it has this cool trippy, like what's real, what's not? Is it all in his mind? Is it all a dream? While also having snapshots of people who knew his brother and are trying to talk Will 
out of or into this decision. He knows and everybody else knows that that choice is going to forever change him and his future if he decides to or to not shoot somebody. It's both a modern ghost story, but also is written in such a way that is short and quick and fast. And Jason Reynolds himself talked about wanting to write it in prose because he wanted to appeal to a variety of literacy levels. This book is an experience. Having the visual of both the words and the shapes of what's going on really helps solidify and like better understand, but also better understand the gravity of the situation. Unfortunately, this is a situation that a lot of young people are finding themselves in and having a book like this to look at is so impactful. And a lot more YA books in particular are being written in prose nowadays, which I think is really cool. And I love that we're constantly changing up the way that we write books. Next up is another classic for a variety of reasons. The number one, it is less than 200 pages, so it is teeny tiny and has a whole lot of plot packed in there. Number two, it deep dives into the idea of morality and vice in the Victorian period. And three, it's gay. God, Oscar Wilde was a damn icon. It's The Picture of Dorian Gray. Since it came out, this book has been a sensation, both because of the reputation of the author and how it still continues to play into how people see beauty, vice, corruption, virtue, and morality. Dorian Gray follows Dorian Gray, a young man who comes into inheritance and comes to start living in London, only to fall into the corrupt society of playwrights. <gasps> but also drugs and parties and alcohol and all the other good fun stuff. It is told through the perspective of Basil, Basil? Dorian's companion who shows him the ropes of society. Dorian, being a beautiful youth, has a portrait painted of him and every time that he sins, the corruption shows up on the painting to make it more and more grotesque and macabre as he still stays young and pretty and beautiful for longer than he should. But of course the devil will always call in his dues and we do see the fall of Dorian and what happens to poor Basil? So not only does this appeal to my my inner theater kid, but it also appeals to my love of fantastical gothic and macabre. The Victorians had a very interesting purity culture that surrounded beauty and virtue being connected. So seeing the way that Oscar Wilde plays into that and then it just twists it is just, ooh, you know that there were some old ladies clasping their pearls. This book is very heavily queer coded and Oscar Wilde himself has been labeled a queer icon. He was likely either gay or bisexual and he was heavily prosecuted uh, for having possibly an affair with a, another important man's son uh, and eventually thrown in jail and died in a work camp. Yet his queer legacy lives on and I think that for all of the gay theater kids out there you gotta read this as an homage. And if you don't want to read the book there's also a movie version starring Ben Barnes that is a visual delight. <laughs> now we're gonna switch things up yet again uh, to go to a book that I read for high school. In grade 12, we had to pick a Canadian lit book and write a book report on it. And I chose this book that has remained one of my favorites. And I would also say started me on a path to actually liking historical fiction. And that is The Virgin Cure by Amy McKay. If you've been on my channel for a little while, you might notice this pops up now and then because I, to this day, it's, wait, when did I graduate high school? 2013? 10 years ago, oh my God. Well, it's been 10 years and I still think about this book. So that goes to show how good it is. It is 1871 Manhattan and our young girl Moth has been sold by her mother to be a servant in a wealthy household. She runs away, ends up on the street and to make money, she ends up going to sell her services to a brothel owner who then picks her up and trains her to be a courtesan. However, during this training, she also meets Dr. Sadie who is a lady doctor and falls into a bit of the like, medical movement of the 1870s as well as becoming acquainted with and then becoming friends with the people who work in the freak show circus side shows of town. But as Moth grows and her training starts to come to an end, Dr. Sadie is trying to get her out of that situation and Moth herself is internally struggling with what her life is going to be versus what she thought it was going to be. It's a look into the ideals of Victorian sex work and women's work and medicine, but also a deep look into the lower rungs of society and what people are doing to survive and then also the lives that people people have eked out for themselves in a world that does not want them. I also believe Dr. Sadie is based on a real person and Moth is also based on a type of girl who eventually became a sensation in the circus sideshows of the time. Me being 17 and the closest thing I'd ever seen to historical fiction was like Pirates of the Caribbean and just like having this blow my mind. <laughs> Don't even get me started on the historical inaccuracies of Pirates of the Caribbean, okay? It is a mess and it is still one of my favorite movies. This is gritty and thought provoking and yet still hopeful and shows the way that women in particular come together and support one another in times of hardship. Speaking of Canadian literature, that's called a segue. Those transitional sentences and essays always got me the like, furthermore, the as alluded to, in the same manner that we talked about Amy McKay being my introduction to historical fiction, 
This author was my introduction to Canadian sci-fi fiction. Oh girl, let me tell you, I'd be getting full marks if I used that sentence. Yet another author that I thought was overhyped and kind of boring and didn't get it until I was forced to read this book. And I think I've reread it, I wanna say upwards of five or six times. And it's Year of the Flood by Margaret Atwood. Whether you love her or you hate her, Margaret Atwood is a Canadian icon and she is on a whole lot of Canadian can lit reading lists. Year of the Flood is part of the Mad Adam trilogy, although you can read each one as a standalone and this is the second one. We now live in a world driven by corrupt corporations, gangs, end of the world cults, and also a bunch of like gene spliced creatures. And like the world is not good. But recently there has been a man made pandemic that has obliterated most of the population. And we follow the lives of two women, Toby and Ren, who are both locked in different places, wondering if the world has returned to the way that it was. And we get to follow them through the before and the after of this plague and how they knew each other, how their lives intersected and how they got to this point. Toby was a poor service worker who was working for some of these shadow corporations and then eventually decided to join a cult to escape a gang leader that was after her. And then Ren is a girl who grew up in the cult that Toby got inducted into and the way that she looks at the world is very different. There's a big emphasis on turning your back on corporate satisfaction and returning to nature, but also doing what you have to do to survive. And then the complicated aftermath of having to explain to people why you did what you did especially in a world which is very close to our own, where like nothing is good and everything is morally ambiguous. This takes there is no ethical consumption under capitalism to a whole new level. Also interesting depictions on sex work and vegetarianism and bees. After this book, I was like, huh, I think I'll take up gardening and not in the way that you think I am. This is gripping and action packed and thought provoking in a way that I was not expecting from a university book. This was one of the first books that I picked up begrudgingly. And then before I knew it, I was halfway through and I'm like, oh my God, am I gonna finish this? Hell yeah, I'm gonna finish this. And then I wrote an essay on it. And that is what learning should be. You should be excited to pick up the book. You should be excited to learn more about something and being able to dissect this in a way that maybe I wouldn't have if I had just picked up a dystopian book before. That was fun. I enjoyed that quite a lot. Okay, English 340, you better work. And lastly is a bit of a cheat, um, but it's my video so I can do whatever the hell I want. And I did ask the teacher for permission and she said yes. The teacher is me. One of the most unexpected works that I got out of university was that I fell in love with plays. And even as a theater kid, rarely do I enjoy reading plays because if you're just reading it like a book, it's all dialogue and you can't have the same experience reading a play as you can a novel. So of course, when you're in grade 11 and you're all taking turns in a circle, reading the lines to the Merchant of Venice and it takes you two straight weeks, not speaking from experience, of course it's boring and stilted because you don't understand how these people are talking to one another. You don't understand the blocking of the scene. You don't even understand what iambic pentameter is yet. That all being said, there is an exception to every rule. Let me tell you about one of my favorite pieces of media ever. And that is the play that is Good Night Desdemona, Good Morning Juliet by Anna Marie MacDonald. I had to read this for, was it a Canadian lit? Canadian theater? I don't remember. I was in university for nine straight years, okay? It all blurred together. This is a satirical take on Shakespeare and it is just as ridiculous as you may think that concept is. Our main character is Constance and she's this middle-aged professor who is obsessed with finding Shakespeare's lost work. And one day when she's studying this lost work, she accidentally falls into a Shakespeare play. She falls into Othello. Of course, her modern ways of looking at things just like start messing up things because she's like trying to stop Desdemona from talking talking to Othello and then she messes up Iago's plans. So the whole play gets totally thrown off track. And then also while she's there, she accidentally falls into Romeo and Juliet and then messes that up because Romeo thinks that she's like this hot young boy cause she's wearing pants. But then like Juliet falls in love with Constance as a boy instead of Romeo. And then the two plays get together and it's just this whole like mucked up mess. They also think she's a witch because she's learned. So then there's all these people that are after her. She's trying to find a way to get sent back to her own time while making sure that everybody gets sent back to their own place. There's Shakespeare and cross-dressing and sword fights. And honestly, that's all I need to know to go to a play. And I have been lucky enough to actually have seen a performance of this and it is 10 times funnier in person. So I would recommend for any type of play 
trying to see if you can find a recording of it, see if you can see it and watch it being performed because you get a totally different experience from that. And whether it's, you know, theater in front of you live or if it's uh, like a movie of it, just something. I really would recommend it because it helps you understand the feeling and the atmosphere that was originally intended for it to give the audience. And of course, a lot of authors write media to be commentary on things and to say something else through their words. But all overall, like media is meant to be entertaining and university at large is meant to expand your mind and like teach you about different things and maybe make you interested in things that you didn't know. And like through just even my English degree, I've learned that Shakespeare plays are actually really fun. It is slapstick comedy and dick jokes and hilarious like cross-dressing scenes to make fun of imperial people. Like it is not high brow. Icelandic poetry, which ergo this is a translation. This is a book on Anglo-Saxon poetry and not only do we have Beowulf, which I love me some Beowulf, but we also have some beautiful elegies. I think some of the uh, Anglo-Saxon Viking elegies are some of the most gorgeous poetry. The Wanderer, the Seafarer, the Wife's Lament. Like these are so gorgeous and I never would have looked into Icelandic poetry if not for that one class. And though I may be biased with my love of Greek mythology, the Greek plays, man, Greek tragedies read like freaking reality TV shows. Clytemnestra really did get the villain edit in Agamemnon and I don't think that's fair. Also Euripides' Medea? Medea is a straight up grade one badass and I don't think that we talk enough about her. Like she helps Jason out, but then as soon as he starts cheating on her, she's like, fuck you, fuck your new wife, fuck your new wife's family, fuck our kids, fuck everybody. I'm gonna kill everybody. And then when you are at your most desolate, I'm gonna ascend with my middle finger up through a golden chariot that was given to me by Hera because the gods love me and hate you because of your stupid damn hubris. And I'm just gonna fly away into the sunset and your ship, the thing that you love most is gonna kill you one day sucks to suck and then just leaves. <laughs> so yeah, here's a reminder that not all required reading is bullshit. <laughs> so when you're doing critiques or deep dives or comparisons on stuff for school, if you can, I would encourage you to have fun with it. I know easier said than done, but like if you really want to focus on like this very specific part of this novel, Ask the teacher if you can. They're probably bored of reading the same essay 17,000 times by all four of their classes writing on the exact same book. Classes will assign you the vaguest baseline topics and books and literature as like a starting point. And that's how you have to think of it as. You have to think of it as a starting point. If you despised one of your required reading projects with all of your heart and soul, write a paper on why. <laughs> I know there's a lot of changing opinions on what should be taught in schools, particularly what should be taught because it's out of fashion. And like, should we keep that to show what our world once was? Or should we move on to more modern ideas and kind of like leave those in the past? I think there's merit to both arguments. I love that I got to read a Greek play from over 1500 years ago. And I also got to read something that came out in 2017. But do I still feel like suing my school every time I think of all the time I wasted reading Sun and Lovers by D.H. Lawrence. Yes. I was inspired to do this because of Evan over on Book Reviews Kill on TikTok and Instagram because he posted a video on some of his favorite books that he had read because of university and then so many of my friends and other people started stitching that video and so now it's like this new revival I guess of like classic books and like can lit. So please leave down below the books that you read for school or for work or for a project that you ended up really loving that were considered required reading. And remember, even if you don't like them, you can still add them to your Goodreads goal. I worked at university in admin while I was going to classes. So like I would leave my job to go to class for an hour and a half and then come back. So I would show up to class in like my, you know, my business casual and then everybody else there would be in like sweatpants and sweatshirts and jean jackets and I was I got asked if I was the professor like a lot <laughs> actually in my last semester of university I just needed credits so I ended up taking a first level Greek tragedies class where that textbook came from just not even thinking about it I was like oh great tragedies this sounds fun not thinking that because it was a hundred level class that it was going to be you know the youngest of the new people. So I walk into the big lecture theater on the first day. I'm in my blazer and like my heels and everybody in that room is like freshly 18. <laughs> And I was just looking around like, oh, I've made a mistake. But my tutorial leader loved me because I would actually answer the questions and um, not to brag or anything, but I did think I got one of the highest marks in that class. <laughs> not to flex in all these people a decade younger than me. <laughs> University was a great time, but I'm so glad that I'm out of it. Now all I get is questions if I'm gonna go do my master's and maybe one day. <laughs> you know where to click to like the video. You know where to click to subscribe. I hope you guys are all having a nice day wherever you are and I will see you all next week. Bye.